the left side here, then we had the what I call some of these cautionary things that keep us from falling into traps, uh, uh, mental traps too often. But it's those are a bit of the breaks of of uh, the scientific approach um, that you know, that you know keep you from uh, from from uh, falling into error and uh, a, a little bit. But we also need the accelerator pedal. We also need um, where the driver is that keep us moving forward. And th that's what, what I describe here as the can-do aspects of science. And so we teach a number of elements there um, that I think keep us moving, um, and e even in the face of our of our of our caution. Um, so you know, an example of that um, is something that we've been teaching, which I don't think I've seen taught in in courses uh, you know, articul uh, articulated this way before. Um, we call it scientific optimism. And uh, we, we introduce it by asking the question, what is the second longest time you ever spent trying to solve a puzzle? And uh, the options are you know, less than an hour, less than a day, less than a month, less than a year, or more than a year. Um, and what we find is uh, that you know, people usually say, oh, you know, maybe less than a day or so um, is, a, is a typical time. The reason that we, we, I, I've asked about the second longest time you ever spent trying to solve those, and we don't, want, we don't want one time you happen to get obsessed. We want something that's a little bit more typical. And the, uh, this, this answer that you know, students would give you know, of, of just uh, maybe a, a day or two or you know, a few days, but less is very typical. Um, we, we, the reason we bring this up is because science has developed a, another trick of the trade, which is this scientific optimism, which is a sort of can-do belief that you can fool yourself into thinking that a problem is solvable long enough so that you will stick to it and, and spend the amount of time it takes to solve a difficult problem. And that's because generally a day or so uh, is just not enough for a really good meaty um, pro problem. And you need something that will uh, keep you going for much longer than most humans uh, are, are, are comfortable uh, with um, in, 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 in sticking to a problem. Um, and we, we find that, um, that you know, in history, if you, if you look back, you, you find that so much of what we were able to do um, goes along with that ability to persistently and iteratively keep working on a problem long long enough to be able to to make progress on it um, and it's it's a uh, it's a very useful tool to have that to have that uh, that that sense of of of, uh, of confidence that it's worth it's worth sticking to a problem now these um these techniques of that I consider the rationality techniques at the on the top of the chart here we now bring down to the the bottom uh, where we approach what happens when humans um, actually try to make decisions and try to work with all this. And the first uh, issue is what are the what are the um, uh, human failings in human cognition? Um, many of uh, people have uh, read things like Danny Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow book where we learn all about the uh, standard you know, heuristics that human thinking uses and then all of the biases and, and uh, mistakes that come about because of that. Um, but one in particular that I want to focus on today is, is we, and we teach a number of them, but one of them is this uh, one of confirmation bias, because that seems to be a particularly visible one in a modern world in which we have so much um, in, information and argumentation available to us um, that there's a real danger that people will tend to pick and choose and uh, take the uh, evidence that they think will support what they already believe, which is, you know, of course, the confirmation bias effect. There's also a, a big um, issue that comes up, surprisingly enough, in modern day science, because nowadays, almost every scientific analysis that you do um, is a fairly complex analysis. We, it's very rare that you just take, uh, you know, 10 numbers and average them together, and that's your analysis. And so, now that you have a fairly complex um, analysis chain for almost any question you, you want to ask, and now that we have lots of data that we're working with and you have to figure out how to select it and, and what you're going to do with it, um, it, it comes along with it a, a whole different set of confirmation bias problems. So for example, um, you'll tend to keep analyzing the data um, different ways and hunting for bugs in your computer program and figuring out you know, which data is good and which is bad until you start getting answers that you expect. And there's a, a real danger that you will stop looking for bugs in your computer program or analysis approaches um, just at the point where you see the answer that you thought you would get. And that's a clear source of confirmation bias. Um, the, the, 
the um, answer to this is something that's only been, uh, I think, you know, put, start, started to be put forward in the last, oh, uh, you know, 10, 20 years, um, which is an approach um, that's called uh, blind analysis. And I think this is a, a, a very interesting thing for two reasons. One, in a course like this, you want to teach it um, just because it's useful to know about. But it's also, I think, very important to teach because um, we want people to realize that the various ways in which we fool ourselves, you know, get change over time. And now that we have so much computing available to us, so much data available to us, um, the uh, the confirmation bias uh, sources are a little bit different than they were before. Um, and so therefore we have to keep looking for new ways to do better and to teach that as well. And that's what we, I, why blind analysis I think is a very important example. Um, in my own uh, field of, of cosmology, um, there's a, a real uh, you know, embarrassing um, uh, case study of this that happened because uh, going back some, you know, to, to the uh, 1930s, um, people have been trying to measure the rate at which the universe is currently expanding. And uh, it turns out you measure it in units of something of kilometers per seconds per megaparsec of distance. So the further away you go, the, the faster you expect to see expansion. Um, and when uh, you know they first started doing measurements, the, the measurements were very poorly you know, poor, difficult ones to make. It bounced around. Eventually, it started settling in um, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s um, to the range between 50 and 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, but something strange happened then, which is if you uh, if you zoom in on the, this uh, few decades of time, you'll see um, that, uh, and we blow it up a little bit. You'll see that what what you started to find was that. Um, there were papers coming from different parts of the community, but um, in there were two fairly prominent groups at the time, and one of them um, was always getting answers around 100, and the other was always getting answers around 50. And you ended up, during that period, um, you could uh, make a guess as to which research group had done the paper just by uh, looking what the answer was uh, for, the, uh, for the last the expansion rate of the universe. And uh, and these actually were both excellent scientific groups. They were actually doing very good work, and they were generally finding uh, things wrong with you know the, the paper that the other group made that were in fact problems. But they apparently only found the problems uh, up to the point that they got the answer back that they expected, either fifty or hundred respectively. And uh, and it took you know some two decades before people started uh, you know. Uh, doing better. And clearly that is greatly slowing down science. And this would have been saved, I think, if people had used blind analysis at that at, at earlier time. So we might have saved ourselves a couple of decades of, of, of effort. Um, and uh, and there are other times where of course the consequences could be even worse um, if you if you know if this has to do with something that we depend on um, for medical purpose, for example. Um, this is something that has was introduced originally in the field of particle physics. It moved uh, into my field in cosmology, and it's it's mostly been used there. It's not uh, you know completely take, uh, taken over, um, but it's mostly not used in many of the other fields of science. And uh, and so this is from a paper that uh, my the, one the uh, the social psychologist who was teaching the course with me um, wrote with me uh, to try to introduce it into the social sciences um, and the social psychology world. So, uh, so I, I think this is an example of that kind of, of, of continuous development um, and why it is that we want to keep teaching a new version of this course uh, you know, every year as we learn more about ways in which we, we go wrong and ways that we can do better. Um, of course, the, these are often individual uh, problems uh, that I was describing under the human condition, but um, there's other uh, problems uh, that are best described as in group thinking. Um, there, you know, you really want to worry about the wisdom of crowds versus herd thinking, uh, you know, choice, and want to make sure that you're using optimal approaches to to group decision making. Um, and one of the things that we make a point of in this class is to teach um, some of the techniques that are used, some principal techniques to weave together um, values, emotions, goals, uh, conflict of interests um, into decision making, along with all those techniques of rationality. And this. You might think that this isn't a, uh, a a need for the scientists to do, um, that this you know this is somebody else's job. But I, I you know really come to the conclusion that it makes no sense 
to, um, to teach all the rationality techniques um, unless you also teach how you use them together with the values and emotions and goals. Um, because otherwise the thing that you'll lose is all the rationality, not um, not not the uh, not the emotions and goals, because they drive the they drive the whole decision making process. So we've been uh, look, looking at different techniques, um, including uh, some in interesting techniques uh, like deliberative polling um, that I think are an important part of the story. Um, and then finally, when you're teaching this much of uh, you know how science does well, um, it's really important I think to um, take a moment to decide to touch on ways in which um, science has gone wrong in the past. Um, and because we don't want people to come away with the idea that just because you call it science, it must be good, um, that you really want uh, th this awareness of all the ways that we, um, have, have, we've gone wrong uh, under the banner of science um, over, over the, you know, the, the uh, centuries and, and even in, in, in recent you know, decades. Um, there's, you know, there's uh, uh, the the natural um, ways that people fall in love with with uh, some scientific result, and and then they 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 uh, they lead people into into error. And it's good for people to be sensitized to those particular ways. But it's also good for people to recognize the ways in which, um, in a political world, um, science has often been used to for a a group that's in power to oppress a group that's that that's not in power. And uh, and you know there've all been terrible you know uh, um, examples where uh, where you know you, science is the justification um, and of course I would consider it to be you know pseudoscience and uh, but it's a justification for that kind of uh, you know these kinds of bad, bad behavior um, and 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 bad consequences in the world so we feel it is important that we we give some of that so that people don't uh, are are sensitized that they shouldn't just uh, you know, use the word science lightly as if anything you do under the name of science must be good. Um, so, so those are the some of the main elements that we've been teaching in in this course. Um, and if we, uh, if you know, I, uh, if we go back to the the other picture, um, you can see that these are just some of these uh, you know two dozen uh, topics um, that. And if if people are curious, we can discuss some of these other ones you know uh, afterwards as well. But I see this in some sense as a vocabulary. Um, that uh, they they together make a a, a a possible to to think about problems in the world um, with a bit of sophistication that is not just for the scientists. It's really I think something that everybody should be uh, learning and everybody should be using. And I think they should be actually learning it and using it not just from uh, you know the university level, um, but even much much younger. And so um, one of the you know one of the questions you could ask is. Um, you know, what would it be that you would like, uh, you know, as students to take away, um, and what would be, what kind of difference should it be able to make after taking a course like this? What would you like that next generation of citizens to be able to do? And you know, first, I, I think it would just be important for them to have understanding of some of these ideas. You know, that of why a shared realistic picture is, is crucial, why probabilistic thinking is so useful, and how easy it is to fool ourselves and and, and be mistaken, and why. That's a, a important tool of work, but this I see as um, a, a, a invitation to doing a much better job of doing group decision making, um, where you you're motivated to find people who you disagree with to listen to them, not to argue with them. And I think that's something that we we have not really seen much of um, uh, the ability to reach out to find somebody who will disagree with you because they're the best critic to help you find out where are you making mistakes. And I think that would be a much uh, more productive format for people to come together to 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 uh, make decisions. Um, I think it's also crucial that people learn uh, what counts as an expert that you should trust. And uh, you you know you don't want to go to the expert who insists that they know the answer and that they must be right. You want to go to the expert who is you know, much more humble, much more likely to be showing you all the ways in which their answer is likely to be true, but the things that you should watch out for um, that they're concerned about where, uh, where there could be, uh, you know, it could turn out to be different than, the, than, they, than their current, uh, they're currently thinking. And I, I think that that's actually a, a, um, a very, would be also very valuable for our, our world to to know what counts as a as a expert that you're looking for. Um, 
we would like, of course, all this to be shared skills uh, that we can do together. And part of that is because when we teach this course, we make the point that even the professors who are teaching it um, fall into these errors ourselves all the time. And that the re one of the reasons to teach it is that we need a community of people, uh, a whole society of people around us who can help um, us find when we're making those mistakes and that it is a, a, a shared uh, skill. It's not something you can do individually. Now, um, we've been trying to ask that question of where do we, where do we teach this material? And so this is something that um, we've been trying in different formats. So um, right now we've been working with the Nobel Prize Foundation, uh, their outreach uh, program to create teaching material that can be taught um, in a full high school level curriculum. And so right now we've uh, just finished the first round of pilot material and it's being tested in schools across the United States and in the uh, and in England as a starting place. But of course, what we'd like is to have a, this curriculum available for anybody in the world to, to grab. And, uh, and we hope that it might be a way to, to start uh, that, that, uh, that next generation of, of activities for, for students. Um, at the universities, uh, we, we've been, as I mentioned, uh, working with Harvard and Irvine. And I think perhaps one of our, our, uh, our participants from, from Humboldt is, is on and could tell us some how they're doing uh, in, 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 the, in this respect as well, because I think they were interested. Um, University of Pennsylvania looks uh, like they may do it, and the uh, University of Chicago has contacted us to, to try it as well. Uh, we're trying to put all the material on a uh, course website to make it easy to teach. Um, so for the faculty, it should be possible for them to find uh, um, quiz material and, and teach material uh, so that um, everybody doesn't have to invent this from scratch. On the other hand, we also think that it's the kind of course that every teacher will have to develop their own way of teaching it um, because it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it should be a very personal story as well. Um, online, uh, we've been starting to try and develop some uh, short video animations that can that could teach the material. And, uh, and we've also been talking to um, the, uh, the, the world famous uh, hands-on uh, science museum, uh, the Exploratorium, to see whether one could imagine developing informal techniques to, to teach it in that, in that setting as well. Um, and we've been putting a lot of effort into developing the ways to um, assess this, uh, this material, to, to see whether or not um, uh, students are, are actually learning it. And so uh, we uh, have in-course assessment material, but also material that you can use for comparisons of people before and after the course, um, how, how much is, is, is learnable of this kind, because we weren't sure that this much meta discussion um, could be learned. And uh, it looks good. I mean, so far um, you're seeing uh, you know, a, a, a broad range of where people come in uh, to a course like this um, with you know, all the way from 40% you know, to, to you know, 90% um, understanding of, of the topics of the course. And at every one of these levels, um, it looks like they, they move halfway to perfection till by the end uh, you're, uh, you're, you're getting um, uh, you know, a, a, very, a very strong uh, result. Um, from uh, you know, almost a whole class learning um, um, almost all the material. So that that's been quite uh, nice to see. Um, of course, you know, over the years, uh, there's, there is many reports and, and standards and science standards that people are, are, are trying to uh, put out. Uh, um, but I think what, what we found is that in most cases, there's a much more detailed description of the details of what should be taught in chemistry or biology or, um, you know, in physics than there is in the details of what should be taught in critical thinking. So part of the point of doing this, of, of doing this whole um, uh, development of, of this course is just so that we are trying out an example where you can look at the details of what it is that you might teach. And, uh, and we hope that this is only the, the first try at this, not the last try, and that uh, there will be many other curricula that are developed of this kind. Um, but with this level of, of, of detail, the same level of detail that you would give if you're developing the, the, what are the elements of a chemistry or biology course. So I think I should try and wrap up there so we have time for, for, for questions and, um, and just leave you with, that, with the, uh, the thought in mind of, you know, what if a basic education uh, really gave everybody this toolkit uh, to solve you know, these problems that they encounter throughout their lives? 
Um, you know, I've, I'm starting to think maybe we should, in, we often, people, people often talk about the education, three hours of you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Um, and I think now we should call it the, the four hours, reading, writing, arithmetic, and scientific reasoning. Mm -hmm.